décrypter les risques dans un monde plus... Discovering risks and understanding them is the uh, theme for this 28th uh, COFAS conference. Now, of course, uh, to understand these risks, you have to know what the emerging markets are, and they're often presented as a homogeneous uh, block, but you'll see that they're very different. So the best would be to talk about it with the experts in the field. So let's have Bruno de Moura Fernandez who is Director of Microeconom Macroeconomic Research in KUFAS, uh, with his team of economists. Uh, so please give them a hand. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Well, good morning, everyone. As you saw this morning, the recomposition of the world is stepping up the pace. Uh, and in the background, uh, we are now questioning Western values, and there is this growing tension between China and the U USA. So this multipolarized, antagonistic, and interconnected uh, world, and apparently uh, chaotic, uh, offers a lot of opportunities for the emerging world. In this new configuration, each one of them can get the best for itself uh, and offer the best opportunities to the to China, USA, or any other regional power. And what it does have, uh, especially those who have natural resources, uh, investment capability, or the right to geographical position. So this multipolarization gives a lot of freedom to new economies, like all these new alliances are showing us, or the uh, criticism of the dollar hegemony, using of local uh, currency for international trade. So now of course, uh, the emerging economies prefer this kind of redirection of flows, uh, and which is upsetting the established order. But emerging economies are not a single block. Uh, their interests are very different, diverging, and they will not all be able to uh, come out of it carefully, because there's a lot of very delicate uh, arbitration to be done. So intra-regional trade will develop on all regions, and uh, using local currencies will also become a standard. The initiative is, of course, just a s symbolic for n the coming years. So I'm here to answer your questions for 45 minutes. You cover Asia. We've been talking a lot this morning uh, of the decoupling between China and the US. Is it already the case? Are we seeing this in China? Are U.S. companies, Western companies, actually leaving China? So the strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China is, is a long-term trend, and that means it's a long-term constraint for companies operating within these two countries. And as we all know, China has been, China's economic rise has been the major growth story over the past several decades. But with the outlook of its continued robust growth looking quite bleak, and also the reshaping of the global world order, companies are indeed asking themselves the questions or questioning themselves whether they should consider de-risking their operations from China, from mainland China. And it's not just the geopolitical reasons. The cost of doing business um, in China has also been rising for Western companies, for foreign companies. Not just for business expenses, you also are looking at risks of geo uh, political risk, regulatory risk. And let's not forget in 2022, where you have the strict zero COVID policy in place, that also raises operation risk. But are uh, Western companies, as uh, Bruno, you, you asked the question, are they actually considered relocating outside of China or away from China? For the moment, I think the answer is not really. If we were to believe the recent surveys from uh, both the American and the European Chamber of Commerce in mainland China, according to their surveys, over 70% of US and European companies are not actually considering relocating Maybe they might be looking at other diversification strategy, of course, just to ensure supply chain resiliency and so on. And I think the reason behind this is quite straightforward. China uh, remains a massive market, and I think Alexis in the previous panel mentioned that it's a formidable market. 
it also still continues to host the world's most comprehensive industrial supply chain, and its workforce remains quite productive, even if you have to pay more for it. So you'd say that Western companies are implementing diversification strategies, de-risking strategies, rather than totally decoupling from, from China. And are there countries in your region that are benefiting from this trend? Um, yes, for, for sure, for, for the Asia region, there is. But it also depends on the sector the company operates in and the markets it sells into. So, for example, if you're a company in the consumer goods space um, and you're enjoying significant revenue from mainland Chinese sales, then you can't really leave China. And what this company they may do is to have an in-China, for-China strategy where they localize the production within China to sell to Chinese consumers so that uh, in just to make their supply chain within the operations more resilient. Uh, but if you're a company in the technology space and you still want to continue to enjoy some of the benefits of manufacturing in China, yet at the same time, you are concerned about what's happening on a geopolitical space, you want to you know, hedge your bets or diversify some of your supply chain out, then you may consider the China plus one strategy or China plus two strategy, where you, your primary production base remains in mainland China, but you have a secondary production base elsewhere, uh, maybe in some parts of Southeast Asia, maybe in India. Um, and and that, that's, that's really, I think what we are seeing also is a significant shift in the FDI flows, uh, especially I think for American companies, uh, American MNCs, and this really uh, goes back even beyond before the pandemic, is before the trade war itself, where we see sectors such as the textile and toy sectors moving away from China to so places like Vietnam, so Bangladesh. And I, I think in this job, uh, economic fragmentation environment, some countries in Asia included, uh, they are trying to take advantage of that. So India, for example, they are trying to get a piece of that manufacturing pie. And you mentioned, I think, the elephant in the room when we think about diversifying supply chains in the region, uh, India, and its massive market of 1.4 billion people. Uh, is really India the next big thing? So this uh, question rem uh, makes me recall a story. Uh, 15 years ago at a forum that I attended, the late founding Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, he was asked a question. And the question was, if he were, if India was given to him to govern, how would he govern in such a way that he can achieve the same success as what he did for Singapore? And his answer was that no single person can govern India because it's such a diverse, diversified country. There are 320 local languages spoken in India itself is so diverse. And in contrast, you know, 90% of Chinese, mainland Chinese, they speak the same language. So if you are speaking, if you are politicians speaking in Hindi, maybe only 25% of the Indian population will understand what you're saying. If you are speaking in English, maybe 15%. So that really illustrates the challenges of doing business as well. And doing business in India remains quite challenging. Uh, companies have to grapple with maybe cumbersome bureaucracy. They have to deal with a slow-moving court process. They may have to deal with some weak capacity of local governments to implement the policies. Um, but having said all this, the India is still the world's fifth largest economy. It has a very youthful population or the um, demographic dividend, as what, what many analysts have to call it. Its medium age is 20, 28 years, and that is 10 years younger than China's medium age, and 20 years younger than Japan's medium age. So you have that huge consumer market potential, which is a huge draw for many foreign companies to look into. And my perspective is that the outlook for India is improving. So there are favorable policy from the government to attract foreign investments uh, such as the Make in India initiative, the uh, production link uh, incentive scheme, which are all focused pretty much on the manufacturing sector. Um, 
you also see India over the past five years investing heavily in inf infrastructure. Um, so there are more highways, new highways, new airports, new port infrastructure in, in particular. So all these are quite positive, and I think it's also reflected in our recent risk assessment for several Indian sectors such as the automotive, the construction sector, of course, and the ICT sector. So as discussed during the geopolitical roundtable, we see that definitely India has massive assets and potential, but also has to tackle some challenges first to really become an alternative to, to China in global uh, value chains. Patricia, um, you cover Latin America. Uh, when we think of US companies nearshoring, friendshoring, we immediately think of Mexico. Uh, is that right? Are there other countries in your region that could benefit from this trend? Yeah, actually, I would, start, I would first start saying that I see that Latin American countries, they are well positioned to benefit from this windfall, uh, thanks to a large availability of raw materials, or the fact that it's uh, well close to the US, a huge market if you compare to China, for instance, or due to geopolitical uh, calm, for instance. But of course, uh, investors should also have in mind some important hurdles, including the fact that countries need to close infrastructure gaps or some countries that are also still too close to trade yeah, and need to foster new trade agreements. But having said this, as you mentioned, uh, Mexico is certainly the best positioned country in my region to, to benefit, and I, I see that's already bearing the fruit somewhat. So we have some recent indicators like gross fixed investment, uh, showing an increase, yeah. or for instance, uh, Mexico surpassed China last year as the main exporter to the US. And I would say that this is due to four main reasons. Uh, one is the fact of being the US direct southern neighbor. Uh, in addition, the US MCA trade agreement that also distinguished Mexico from other neighboring economies. Uh, the fact that already counts with, uh, with a large manufacturing uh, industry and a skilled workforce. Um, in addition, well, Costa Rica could also be an interesting uh, choice, an attractive destination, because you have their multiple uh, trade agreements, uh, a largely clean energy matrix, also some advanced industries like uh, pharmaceuticals or, or microprocessors. So you mentioned Mexico, Costa Rica, and what about the biggest economies in South America? Brazil, Chile, Argentina, I guess they must have some significant assets, right? Yes, yeah, sure. When we think about business environment in Latin America, uh, well, then Chile is always uh, very well placed. And this, even despite the, the uncertainty in recent years about uh, their attempt to rethink their economic model uh, to, through a uh, failed constitutional writing process. But despite that, we still have a very friendly environment there. Uh, about Brazil, so well, Brazil is the largest economy in my region, so of course we have there a huge consumption market, uh, ample industry base, uh, many uh, natural resources and easy access, access to it. But on the other hand, some points about limited uh, foreign trade agreements. So uh, we have some recent attempts to refresh the Mercosur trade agreement, and I see that if successful, this would be something very welcome. And finally, about Argentina, well, I'm not saying this because I'm Brazilian, but uh, on the contrary, I would say that uh, in the short term is a little challenging right now. Well, we have many macroeconomic imbalance there, uh, like the acute lack of foreign currency reserves or the capital controls, uh, skyrocketing inflation. Uh, so there we have a new government of the libertarian Javier Millet. He's trying to fix that, uh, but we cannot take for granted that this will work. Yeah? So uh, I expect a very bumpy road ahead and things should get to work before it get better. So all the biggest economies in your region, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, even though they have to tackle some issues first, are well positioned to attract uh, US Western investments. But on the other end, several countries in your region, if not all of them, also got closer ties with China in recent years, correct? Correct, uh, definitely. And I think that's not only recent years, but actually the last two decades uh, in different spectrums, notably in terms of trade. So uh, become, China became the main destiny for exports from Brazil or Chile and Peru, but also as a lender or through investments of Chinese companies in Latin America. And this includes sectors like uh, mining or infrastructure, like telecoms and energy too. Uh, mostly this investment went to Brazil, but also we had investments or large 
volume of investments to Argentina, Peru, or Chile. Uh, and looking ahead, I, I don't expect this trend to be reverted, and this is because of the Chinese interest in the in the green economy. So Latin America is very yeah, rich in uh, much needed uh, natural resources like uh, copper or lithium. So I understand that this uh, relationship will be a long-lasting one. And uh, it's also important to note that already 21 countries in Latin America already signed into the Belt and Road Initiative. And just to conclude, in terms of political interest, uh, I see that uh, Latin American countries more recently, they have tried to keep good uh, rela diplomatic relations with the two sides, so with US, Western uh, countries, and with China. It, this even includes uh, Millet in Argentina, who during campaign strongly criticized China, also decided not to join the BRIC groups, but after he took office, he toned it down. So very few countries clearly choose one ally over the other. I think it illustrates perfectly how in its new configuration, in its new world, emerging countries try to take advantage of what they can offer to China or to US or, or to any other regional power. Um, Aroni, you, you cover Africa. Um, we often hear that uh, Africa is a privileged partner of China, which has invested heavily in recent decades. But on the other end, uh, in this current environment of high interest rates, strong USD, uh, we've seen several countries in Africa in debt distress, with the last one being Ethiopia in late December. Uh, has it changed China's strategy in Africa? Well, first of all, I think it's still important to note that um, China remains a major trading partner for many African economies a very large source of funding, as well as a considerable source of foreign direct investment. Also, I'd like to come back on the two last decades that you and Patricia mentioned. So not only does it mark uh, the rise of China as this huge emerging power, there is also a very important policy that is called the Go Out policy that was initiated in the year 2000, uh, where the Chinese authorities really uh, encouraged Chinese companies to invest abroad. And that really went hand in hand with the strategy of China towards the African continent, but not only, which was on the one hand to secure key commodities for its own development, and on the other to benefit from the growing momentum in terms of investment and of demand of some dynamic African economies. Um, on the funding part also, uh, much of that financing was actually infrastructure financing, which went hand in hand with the development uh, of these economies. So as you said, recently we have seen uh, a slight reversal um, on, in that strategy. I think that there are three main uh, factors behind that. Uh, the first one is more unfavorable dynamics. We talked about it uh, in terms of growth and of public financing in China. And then there are also um, domestic policy shifts. So I mentioned the go-out policy. In 2021, China announced uh, that it planned uh, to reduce overseas capital outflows. Uh, and also at the 2021 China-Africa Cooperation Council, Council um, China announced its first cutback in financial support uh, to the African continent, which is really in contrast with that policy. Um, and the third reason is simply reduced risk appetite, especially towards uh, countries with uh, strong indebtedness. So historically speaking, China's loans towards the African continent were quite concentrated. So actually, uh, there were five countries that made up 55% uh, of official bilateral debt uh, to China, um, Zambia, Cameroon, Nigeria, Kenya, and Angola. Uh, and as you can see, regionally speaking, most of that debt is geared towards countries uh, which are in Eastern and Southern Africa. In 2021 and 2022, we noticed that most of the loans th that China made to the African continent were now towards West Africa, so countries like Senegal, Benin, or Côte d'Ivoire, which not only have uh, stronger macroeconomic fundamentals in terms of growth drivers, uh, but also more moderate indebtedness uh, issues. Yeah. If I may add something here, of course. yeah, I would say that the same in Latin America. We have also seen uh, a reduction in the financing of troubled countries in my region. Well, the most emblematic case is Venezuela. Well, it's not a big surprise, no. Uh, we have seen a peak of uh, financing to Venezuela in 2010 and strongly went down after 2015. So I would say that it's not only con uh, considered uh, Africa, but also more broad base, uh, also including Latin America. So, as Patricia said, the, the, the approach, especially regarding financing, is more cautious. 
All that being said, China will remain a key actor on the African continent for the foreseeable future. Maybe the vector of China-Africa relations will now be more centered around trade. New tools such as TCI will emerge instead of direct loans in order to have a, a better uh, management of the risks and also a more prudent approach by choosing country with just stronger macroeconomic fundamentals all across the board. You mentioned the elephant in the room, Bernard mentioned it as well. We talked about China plus one. It's important also to consider India in the context uh, of uh, strategic relations on the African continent. Um, India is and has a very well-defined strategy regarding Africa. It is already the second individual country in terms of market share uh, behind China, and it is entering the African markets quite strongly through sectors India is leader in, which is pharmaceutical and tech, and benefiting also from the demand from African countries in the areas of digitalization and healthcare. So we would say that China will likely continue to increase its involvement in, Ch in Africa, but on a more selective basis. Um, and in terms of global value chains, uh, we know that Africa, or at least many African countries, are not that integrated yet in global value chains. Uh, which country or which countries could be the, the winner or are the best position to be the winner in this new global chain, in this new multiple world? Well, there are already some African countries that are actually integrated into value chains or regional value chains or uh, value chains that are specific to some sectors. So let's mention Morocco and Tunisia, uh, which are part of the European value chain in sectors such as uh, automotive and aeronautics. You also have countries like Ethiopia and Mauritius, uh, who are part of the textile clothing value chains, where there is a global shift towards countries uh, with lower unit labor costs. Um, the reason why there are not more African countries integrated into the global value chains is simply because of the existence of still large infrastructure gap, governance issues, lackluster business environment, uh, as well as, we have to say it, security risks uh, in, in, in some regions of the continent. That being said, you have some very dynamic uh, African economies, the champions of growth, Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, which have um, booming industry and services sectors, which are likely to benefit from uh, a reconfiguration or even just um, the moving of value chains towards uh, southwards. And do you see sectors that are particularly promising? Well, on the African continent, there are many, uh, but I would like to focus uh, perhaps on some. Let's talk about the renewable energy sector. Um, the, due to Africa's very large endowment in natural resources, um, that sector is particularly promising in the context of the global energetic transition. Countries like Namibia in mega projects of green hydrogen, South Africa and Morocco uh, in wind and solar. Uh, then there are also countries a, a bit similar to Cote d'Ivoire and Tanzania, which have uh, a combination of booming industry and services, uh, Ghana, although it's in uh, restructuring now, still has very strong uh, fundamentals. Rwanda, Uganda, uh, which are also in a region of Africa, in East Africa, which is very dynamic, which already are quite uh, strong transport and logistics hubs, and which could become pinpoints to enter the continent, like Morocco has become in, in, in North Africa in one sense. Uh, finally, there are also intercontinental value chains that will emerge as when the continent develops. And in that regard, I think that large economic actors also have um, a role to play. So South Africa, for instance, uh, still will be, I think, important in the creation of the pharmaceutical value chains, or Nigeria in construction and fintech, which is really booming. Uh, lastly, but very importantly, uh, if we consider the upstream part of value chains, uh, there are many commodity exporters uh, on the African continent, and they will obviously be part of uh, the value chains to some extent. Speaking of commodities, Seltem, you cover Middle East and Turkey. Uh, what about GCC countries? What will be the role in this new reconfiguration of trade flows? Uh, yes, actually, um, GCC countries will continue to play an important role uh, in terms of this uh, regionalization of the world trade. And, um, but actually, we can think about this regionalization of the world trade uh, as a um, uh, diversification of the capital resources that these countries need, actually. Um, if we take the example of the, their access to the, their potential access to the BRICS group, 
so we know that the BRICS group represents around 30% uh, of the world geography and 40% of the world population. So, um, and we know that, for example, for the United Arab Emirates, uh, their trade volume with Brazil uh, has increased by around 30% recently, and um, China is already the United Arab Emirates' uh, largest trade partner. So it will allow this country to widen uh, its regional trading hub position. So the uh, benefits will be mostly similar for Saudi Arabia, but we should keep in mind that for Saudi Arabia, this uh, invitation to the BRICS group has occurred at a, I would say, a spe uh, special time uh, when China has brokered this agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran to resume their diplomatic uh, ties. So. Um, such um, regionalization moves will allow those countries to be more agile in terms of economy, but also in terms of politics. And in the same time, uh, of course, they will continue to be the United States key um, security partner partners in the region. So um, it will allow actually those countries to um, balance better their ties between the West and the East. And also this uh, multipolarization uh, will, it doesn't mean that it, um, countries will be forced to pick up a side. For example, smaller countries like Qatar um, has placed itself like a neutral state, which will give this opportunity to um, this country to act as a mediator if there are some challenges between some countries, like uh, which we see in the region currently. Definitely. Uh, in this new multiple world, DC countries appear to be so well positioned to make the most of their opportunities thanks to their massive natural resources. Uh, but on the other hand, they have all embarked on diver diversification strategies. Uh, how do you see that? Will it work? Well, um, this diversification strategies have been around, I mean, have been implemented since nearly 10 years. And it has started uh, by this decline in oil prices. So, uh, yes, the process, of course, will continue, but we notice two dilemmas here. The first one is that the diversification itself depends on the oil revenue. And the second one, the fact that they all diversify into the same sectors like uh, construction, tourism, and finance, finance um, creates this intra-regional competition. So yes, the process will continue, but it will continue with this kind of internal dilemmas. Yes, Aroni? Yeah, just to jump on what you said on diversification, and um, I think that it's also a very key point for commodity exporters uh, on the African continent, uh, simply because um, diversification enables to have more stable growth drivers uh, in the long term. Uh, but as Seltem mentioned, the problem for African commodity exporters and the reason that diversification is not going very fast on the continent is specifically because public revenue is so dependent on the commodity windfall. And to that, I'll also add a second second point is that if we consider all of the African mineral exporters who have a lot of minerals that are very necessary to the energy transition, there is not really an incentive at the global level for them to diversify away from these minerals because of the demand that there, there will be in the long term for those commodities, whereas the diversification would be required for the domestic growth outlook. Um, so that will be a, a conundrum um, to, to monitor and that African countries would have to resolve at some point uh, in order to at, at attain sustainable sustainable development. Yeah, so the road of diversification will be bumpy for DC countries, for African countries. And well, it's true, all of them target the same sectors. And then, of course, n not all will be able to, to diversify actually their, their economies. Uh, we've not mentioned yet one country um, whose, I think, geographical position and comparative advantages could make it the winner uh, in this new world, Turkey. Um, could Turkey be an alternative or further 
an alternative to China in global value chains? Well, um, I would say Turkey has always this opportunity, but um, the greatest opportunity it had was right after the pandemic. And um, because at that time, uh, companies which didn't want to remain stuck in China uh, have started to looking for more closer uh, markets to invest in, in order to shorten and cheapen their lead times. And Turkey was considered between um, um, among those countries. But um, because Tur uh, Turkey uh, had its own uh, domestic economic um, challenges, I would say, uh, like the hyperinflation and the sharp volatility in Nira and the negative uh, real interest rate policies and etc., it kind of halted this process. And we saw that the FDI stock uh, in the country coming from the European um, countries has declined to around 64% of the total recently from around 70% on average between 2010 and 2019. Uh, so, but we can't say that these opportunities have finished. Um, if Turkey is able to reduce its economic imbalances, then uh, which um, we 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 consider this as a key scenario, but it will it won't be an easy task for the economic authorities. Then it can restart attracting uh, foreign investments, but it will be a gradual process. Um, on the other hand, it will not depend only uh, on Turkey's own economic conditions. It will also depend on the situation of the world uh, economy, but also world geopolitical developments. For example, if, um, if we think about the recent developments on the Red Sea, uh, if those continue, then many companies can uh, start reconsidering to invest in Turkey in order to escape from the risks of uh, higher costs and those uh, threats of these attacks. On the other hand, um, there is also uh, the creation of new economic corridors. Uh, well, we know that Turkey is a key uh, hub in uh, China's Belt and Road initiatives, but um, uh, there's a new uh, trade corridor that links um, uh, India to the Middle East and to Europe. So this risk to bypass Turkey. But of course, these are these will be the external factors, and the key factor for Tur Turkey to attract new investment uh, will be how it will reduce its own economic imbalances. So first, they have to tackle some challenges. And also, I, I think that what you mentioned uh, with India and Turkey, two emerging countries uh, with competing interests and then in fierce competition to attract more investments or to expand here uh, trade relations with, with Europe is a very good example. Uh, they're not homogeneous and, of course, sometimes they have competing uh, interests. Let's move on to another topic. I think a major trend, the use of local currencies for trade. Um, last year, the BRICS have announced their intention to use a common currency, or failing that, local currencies for the trade. Uh, Bernard, uh, is it already happening in, in Asia? Are Asian countries already trading in local currencies? So yes, there is an increasing trend of de-dollarization movement in Asia. And I think the, the reasons behind that for Asia, well, at least, uh, over the past few years, more of they want to have more intra-regional trade. They want to be more integrated within the region. But of course, with the uh, outbreak of the war in uh, Russia, uh, in Ukraine, um, so that has also shifted the concerns towards, you know, will some of the countries be uh, faced with economic sanctions using the US dollar? And to give you a few examples, last year, the member states of the Southeast Asian economies, they come together with an agreement to increase the use of local currencies for trade. And last July, India and Bangladesh also did something similar. 
And let's not forget uh, also that China is very keen to promote the use of uh, the renminbi as a, a global currency. And they have signed an agreement with, uh, with Brazil to use the local currencies for trade settlements. And China also completed its first cross-border uh, LNG transaction with the United uh, Arab uh, Emirates using the local currencies to settle the trade. Um, <laughs> so you can see that this uh, trend is ongoing, but I think that um, de uh, de dollarization is a very gradual process because the dollar will still remain quite dominant currency for the foreseeable future. Teltem, you want to add something? Yeah, actually, I, t I agree with uh, Bernard saying that the de-dollarization is, is happening, but it's a very gradual process. So just to add that the same uh, initiative has occurred between Saudi Arabia and uh, China as they too have agreed to uh, trade oil in denominated in uh, yuan. So it's a small share of the world oil trade, but it is something to, that people need to start to consider for the future. So that's definitely uh, a major trend. Uh, in, in Asia, I think in particular, we see that not only with China, but also all the countries in the region are trying to promote the use of local currencies. Patricia, uh, Bernard mentioned the agreement uh, between China and Brazil. How does it work in practice? Uh, well, in Brazil, President Lula, he has positioned himself in, fa in favor of diversification, uh, but it seems very embryonic for now. Uh, he has defended the creation of a common currency between BRIC countries, and indeed, during the, the group summit in August last year, they announced that they will start developing this currency. But it's still early to say, it still lack details to say that this will really uh, be a, a big thing. Uh, and finally, uh, last September, Brazil and China, they completed a test carrying out the first commercial operation using only their local currencies, the Hell and the Yuan. And besides of this agreement, are there other initiatives underway in Latin America? Uh, well, we have some other few initiatives, but I don't see that the USD uh, is threatened in the short term in my region, for instance. Uh, I would give the example of Argentina. So, as I mentioned before, in Argentina we have a really a lack of foreign currency reserves. So, last year they decided to use a credit swap line with China in the UN to pay for imports. And even the IMF allowed Argentina to pay for its debt obligation in October uh, 2023 using the swap line. Lines. But after December, after Millet took office, according to the news, uh, China decided to suspend the line, the credit line. So, well, it's not really a big surprise, but... Well. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, during the campaign, uh, Javier Millet said that he would not do any deal with communists, referring to China, so uh, I'm not sure it was a good way to start on the, on the right foot. Um, Aroni, uh, um, regarding this issue or this topic of... Um, trading in local currencies uh, between the BRICS members. What is the position of uh, South Africa? Well, the South Africans certainly have um, toned down uh, on the BRICS currency. And actually, if you think about it, it makes sense because um, South Africa's main trading partners um, are China, Europe, the US, UK and Japan. Uh, so actually, it does not make much sense for them in the commercial way to have a common com currency, considering these trade partners. Uh, also, South Africa, geopolitically speaking, wants to maintain uh, diplomatic, military and commercial ties with both its traditional Western allies as well as the large emerging powers, especially of the BRICS group. Um, so really pushing in one direction could endanger the relations with the other. In fact, in 2023, we saw some tensions between the United States and South Africa uh, regarding joint naval military exercises with China and Russia, which ultimately were resolved diplomatically, which shows uh, the willingness of both parties in this instance uh, to remain broadly neutral. So, once again, I think it's a very good example of uh, emerging countries trying to, once again, not choose one ally over the other, to have good relationships with China, with the US, or with any other, other, other countries. You mentioned earlier also the very strong ties um, between China and African countries, or most of them. 
are African countries already tra trading in renminbi or not yet? Um, obviously, due to China's very strong integration on the African continent, uh, trade in yuan exists. Um, in fact, uh, there was a cross-border yuan settlement center that has opened in EU, which is in China, and which is the world's largest market for small commodities. Uh, and that center looks to enhance the cross-border yuan flows uh, between China and Africa, and also enhance the cooperation uh, of local subsidiaries of Chinese banks uh, on the African continent and the African financial institutions. So it is definitely being encouraged, especially by the Chinese authorities. Um, if I just come back to the question of de-dollarization as a whole, um, I don't see it happening anytime soon on the African continent. If you look at exports uh, on the African continent, well, most countries export outwards to the rest of the world and commodities of which the trade is in dollar. Um, so under 15% of all African exports are directed towards other African countries, which is very low and it has progressed only very marginally in recent years. Um, there are numerous trade and customs agreements uh, on the African continent, um, the ECOWAS, COMESA, the SADC, the SSEU, with the very ambitious project of the African continental free trade area, uh, which could bo boost Africa to Africa exports to around 25% in uh, less than 20 years. Um, but of which um, the implementation will be tricky, not only because of the size, over 40 countries are concerned, but also because large regional powers, exporters, South Africa or Nigeria, could try to quite aggressively defend their interests if those were jeopardized by the rules of this free trade area. So definitely it is something that will happen and that is key for the development of Africa, but which is still very nascent. So the dollar is likely to remain dominant in the, in, in the continent in the medium term. Bernard, we keep coming back to, to China. Um, with the, decoup de the decoupling from the US, is China looking for further regional integration? So China has always been looking out for, for more economic integration because for, for themselves, the domestic market, even though it's large, but a lot of the companies are looking outwards just to maintain, uh, just to reduce some of the excess capacity. And China is also a member of the world's largest free trade agreement, the RCEP, which is made up of 15 Asian Pacific economies. And it is applying for the more stringent, higher standard CPTPP, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in which the US pulled out under President Trump. And I think one of the important dynamics in trade uh, within Asia is the evolving dynamics of trade linkages within Asia itself. So instead of the tradition, uh, traditional, the US, the Europe, and Japan as a final source of demand, increasingly China itself and other emerging Asia economies, they are becoming an important source of final demand. Well, time is, is running. Uh, to conclude this round table, I will ask you a very difficult exercise uh, because I know you. I know you could speak for an hour of your countries, uh, but let's say, in one minute, if you were to sum up in one minute the outlook in 2024 in your region. Um, Bernard, let's start with you. Um, sure. So uh, I think Asia Pacific will remain a dynamic region for 2024. <laughs> no stress, but there is a clock behind you. <laughs> come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> you just wasted five seconds. <laughs> And some of the, uh, and it will, con it will be a, continues to be a major contributor to global GDP, uh, I think somewhere between 50% of global GDP. Uh, some of the bright spots this year will be a continued recovery in the electronic sector, the ICT sector, which will benefit a lot of the economies in Asia. Uh, the other one will be the ongoing tourism rebound, uh, especially with more Chinese outbound tourists coming into play because 10% of GDP in Asia Pacific is linked to tourism and travel. So, but growth itself is going to be uh, slower uh, than before the pandemic. And I think one thing to note for, for Asia, is, or one, one word about China, I have five seconds left, uh, <laughs> is that the tensions between its structural transformation and the near-term headwinds is going to mean that recovery in the Chinese economy for this year will remain bumpy. Uh, we are forecasting 4.3% uh, this year, which is a full percentage or nearly a full percentage point lower than the 5.2% growth of last year.
So you have definitely lost. I hope that the other one will be a, a bit better than you. Uh, but no, I mean, definitely Asian countries will be the major source of, uh, of GDP growth. Uh, and well, despite, let's say, the deceleration in, uh, in, in China. Patricia, try to do a bit better. Yeah, let's see. So <laughs> in Latin America, we're expecting uh, GDP growth to continue accelerating from 2.3% last year to 1.6, including in the two largest economies, so Brazil and Mexico. Uh, in Brazil, due to lower, a relatively lower fiscal stimulus, in addition to uh, lower agriculture output. Last year, we had a record crop. This year, we have the presence of El Nino. Uh, in Argentina, no, I'm sorry. Um, well, in Mexico, uh, we see that near shoring and fiscal Fiscal stimulus as the country approach presidential elections will remain key drivers. On the contrary, we have the lower GDP activity in the US, the accelerating activity would uh, have negative spillover effect. And finally, Argentina. So in Argentina, we see a second year in a row of recession as Millet tried to push ahead with a fiscal austerity, which in turn will take inflation to even higher levels. And so to, to conclude, I would say that the risk of social tensions there will remain high in due to this uh, difficult environment. Well, well done. Well concluded. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Finished. I'm afraid it's the only time you will applaud. <laughs> I'm not sure the, I mean, Aroni, you will lose, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> you will see, you will see. Um, Seltem, a very easy question to answer in uh, 60 seconds. Will finally inflation be tamed in Turkey in 2024? Um, so, uh, this is what we expect to happen uh, from the second half of the year on. So, we expect the annual inflation in Turkey to uh, fall somewhere between uh, 42 to 45 uh, percent from around 65 percent of uh, last year. And this will be due to a um, new policy set that has been introduced after last year's general elections, which are based to uh, higher interest rates uh, and tighter monetary and financial conditions. However, the fiscal policy remains still accommodati accommodative because we will have um, in this March the local elections, but after that, we expect the fiscal policy uh, to become restrictive and the inf this inflation to start uh, from uh, the second half on. <laughs> well, well, okay. Um, so inflation will remain quite, quite high. Um, well, Aroni, uh, let's end on a positive note and try not to speak uh, four minutes. <laughs> So I'm going to lose this game, but Bernard didn't win, so I'm sorry for your loss, Jean-Christophe, for your bet. It does, it's, it's okay. Uh, for the African continent, uh, we do expe expect a slight rebound in growth to around 3.6%, which is still below the, the potential of above 4%. Uh, differences between the resource intensive and the non-resource intensive countries. So basically, commodity exporters will have a bit slower growth place because uh, commodity prices are relatively lower, whereas the more diversified economies will benefit from their driver of domestic demand in the form of consumption and investment. Um, the funding squeeze is very real, so, um, and that combined with uh, the eroding level of reserves means that we are likely to see more debt, debt sustainability issues and probably more sovereign defaults. Political risks are heightened, we're in an election year, we saw a lot of coups in the three past years, so that would obviously be to monitor. Now, the positive note is that, um, you know, the African continent will be the second most populated by 2050. Um, people tend to forget, especially in the West, that it will be the second engine of global demand in the next 20 years. I know the timer is out, but I'll just finish on this. Um, <laughs> The, expected. There are many strong emerging markets that will be also there in, in the next two decades. Um, so despite all of the risks, um, Africa is and will remain a land of opportunities. And <laughs> well, definitely 2024 will be again a very challenging year for emerging countries. But I think it's worth noting also that in 2024, there will be more than ever the main engine of global GDP growth. Then, in the medium term, we have seen during this roundtable that many countries in every region are also very well positioned to continue to be the main driver of global activity. Thank you very much for your insightful contributions, guys.
Merci beaucoup.